Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, New Hunter Church of Christ. Nobody, again, has not showed up. I don't know what's going on with this generation we're living in, but I tell people about the church, and people just, just don't have a bone. They don't want to come to a small church. They want everything given to them, I guess. They don't want to have to work or have a challenge. But we're going to, t- we're going to continue. Enough of that. We're going to continue with Romans 13. And it's called... The True Meaning of Submission, and it's by, uh, it's the second edition, and it's by Timothy and Chuck Baldwin. Okay, and that's what we're going to be reading. And the chapter that we're going to be reading from is, uh, it's called Higher Powers Ordained Only for the Good of the People. So, that's what we're going to be talking about, it's chapter 6. Before we go into that, let me, um, let's pray for a minute. Dear Lord, thanks for this wonderful day, and thank you for bringing us together and be able to converse freely and openly and be able to express your opinions and without retribution or persecution, Lord. And thank you for that the powers be that they allow us to be able to continue to do this so that people can know and so that governments can remain sure and steadfast to what their real mission and goal is, and that's to be servants for you, not to be, a serp- not to be usurpers over other people. But yet they're supposed to look out for the rights of individuals to protect society as a whole for the people. Because that's how they were brought in power by God and also by the people. So Lord, uh, help us to be able to do that today as we go into chapter 6. As I read this aloud. And hopefully it will help other people. And hopefully that people will learn more. to go, And that I'll be able to bring more to the table supernaturally. And also uh, more so that. People will learn more and know more about it. And uh, help me, Lord, bring something from your word beyond it, from your message, Lord, from your word, Lord, as we read this. In Jesus' name, pray, amen. Well, I hope your day has been good. My day has been good. It's been long. Uh, we've got a $200 electric bill here. It needs some help with. Um, I also have a credit card bill because I haven't got a lot of business in here. So I'm hoping that people will help me with that. I don't usually ask for help unless I really need it, but I hope you can help me by giving me work because I am a I do IT work. I don't mean to plug this door in church time, but I do. I'm just so media. I've been in business for over 10 years, but we went public last year, but I've been doing it on the side. And I was doing real good, so I went public last year, and so far this year has not been good for my business, and I don't know why. So I was wondering if you all can help me out by you know referring me. I'm just so media. I'm based off of Coal Harbor Road in Mechanicsville, Virginia. And uh, I wanted to tell you that if um, you would like to help us out, my address is 7110 New Hunter Road, apartment 423, Mechanicsville, Virginia, 23111. Phone number to make a credit card donation is 8804-789-9373. We really do need your donations. Electric bill needs uh, help. Didn't get no donations in July. So if you can help, you know, uh, just ask you prayerfully. If you could give, because our ministry is holy and it is just, and what we're doing is for the valiant good for the people, and that's what you give tribute to. It's a monetary thing. We're not asking you to give it with force or order, because that wouldn't be godly. So, Lord, I'm just, I'm just hoping that people will help us at this time, and I hope that people will see it in their heart that they'll be able to do that too as well. Thank you, Lord, for you know. Thank you that we're able to do this, and and that people will see to their needs, and that they can come here and maybe give me some work and buy some of our dust blowing spray for their electronics and computers, and hope that people will be able to help us in that regard with work to get donations in that way, and also I can help them by getting their computers fixed and getting them cleaned of viruses and malware. Thank you, Lord, for thank you that we're able to do this, and I hope that y'all can help prayerfully with us in this regard by making a donation financially or donating in a way of, you know, help me with getting some work. Uh, Because I really do need it. Um, Electric Bill uh, needs it because it's very hard right now. Uh, With all this travel, that's why I had to cut off all the stuff because I wouldn't get any donations. And I hope that people will send some donations so we can bring more news to you than just what I put out. But anyway, we're going to dive into Romans 13 chapter in the book, Romans 13 in the Bible. And we're going to be looking at chapter 6 in the book. Uh, the True Meaning of Submission, the second edition by Timothy and Chuck Baldwin, award-winning noun authors of this book. It's the second printing of it. And uh, let's go in here and read here. It says, in Romans chapter 13, it clearly states that higher powers are only 
ministers of God for the very benefit of people for good, not for doing bad. So only governments, basically, in other words, only governments which probably execute the pact of which society, individuals, uh, took for their protection, happiness, pursuit of happiness, and peace are ministers of God. Uh, this is plain given where Paul describes of higher powers as being those who praise people for doing good and punish those people for doing what is evil. Evil and unjust men and women do not praise good, and they do not get God's approval either. They basically what they do instead of getting God's approval and doing good, they terrorize it and distort all sense of right and wrong and what is wrong. It says even good men and women can distort justice by their ignorance or their self interest. It says personal interest or character is not the very is not the criteria or basis for God's ministers. If they were God's standards would be based all upon personal motive and feeling and not based on God's laws. Okay, But this is not true, see, because they're based on God's laws, not based on feeling. So that's why it's true, and that's why it's not true. We don't base it on a whim or by a feeling. We base it on God's laws. That's why that statement above this is not true, because I'm telling you, the true answer is that we base it on God's laws and God's uh, nature. All right. Now, government rulers who lead through or by their own vision uh, do make people to perish, meaning they die. All right. In sharp contrast to those who keep God's law and, and follow his commandments. This kind of uh, incorrect or law rejection leadership holds a self-destruction nature. You know, legitimate, God's ordain, that's legitimate to God's ordained government, okay, um, consists only of, you know, ministers of good in the, for the purposes of executing wrath upon him or those that do evil, okay, in so far as the law fails of this. I gotta go over here. Uh, of this common welfare. All right. It possesses no binding power. It says if higher powers are ordained in performing evil, then the use of the words good in quotations and evil distorts all scriptures entirely. It says near the beginning God ordained or has ordained a justice system, you know, defining good and what is evil relative to the relationship to others. This was what separated the nation of Israel as a better nation than other nations of the world or in, that, in their early stages. Israel was a nation that was based upon God's very laws. In, con in creation, the nation of Israel, God more firmly established a criminal and civil justice system of laws, which was to be followed for the benefit and advantage of society. This adding of the civil law more clearly expressed God's ordination of government. The it also should, it also gave the boundaries of government as well, and man's duties and rights were also there as well. It says without. A clear expression of law, those who were in power or in power may have little 
incentive, you know, not to uh, transgress the rights or trample all over the rights of citizens. And the citizens may have uh, questionable authority to rebuke and to resist those rulers who transgressed or trampled all over the laws of God. All right. These laws provided a more sure method of discerning what is good and evil, which significantly reduced the ability of those in society who, like Nimrod in the book of Genesis, assert that their, you know, brute power proves the rightful basis or criteria of their authority. Simultaneously, it shows the limits of submission. It says, God's laws work wrath against all those who break it, including God's fundamental and immutable, and immutable laws okay, of nature. God expects for all nations to follow his eternal and, immut and immutable laws or standards of justice, which really is laws. All right, this benefactor, uh, this, bene this benefactor description of ordained government is confirmed in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 in the King James Version as well as where God tells all Christians to pray or tells Christians to pray to rulers so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and in honesty. See, that's so important, you know. We need to emphasize that because that's so important. Do we have that today? It's very rare. It's not very like that. It should be like that, but it's not that way. And our government's the opposite of that. There's some going on, but it's a lot more things that are opposite of that than of what God originally ordained to set, that was set up from God in the beginning, which is the way our government and all governments of the world should operate the way God set it up originally. But anyway, let's go on. Because only people, not government, can live, you know, a life. A government has no life of its own. Government has only fictitious formality or formalities and power or powers, depending on how you want to look at that, which is limited by its very nature and scope. You know, government is ordained only for our sakes and benefit not for theirs I mean government doesn't do these things for their own benefit no it's for our benefit it says the entire creation of God is to be rejoiced by all mankind you know that doesn't matter if you're rich whether you're poor or whether you're elite it doesn't matter because it's this guarantee or this this uh, type of agreement was given Totally by God. You see, so that is so important. It says this truth serves in part as a basis um, for equal and natural rights and justice. God requires justice and rights in every society on this globe. Undoubtedly, those who labor honestly have. The God, their God-given right to enjoy the fruits of their labors. And those who gain dishonestly, we're going to see you know, whether or not they work in the government or not, uh, deserve not the gain from it. Okay, So if you're honest, of course you deserve it. If you're not, you don't. Individuals do not form society to be enslaved by it. No. They form society, society or societies to a single moral body of people for their and their neighbors and their personal security. 
and happiness and peace. You know, they pact with each other to form a government to that end is based upon the mutual principles or laws that are from God or of God. It says natural laws are relative to society. It is impossible that the f that the formation of a government or society coupled with its distortion uh, of laws could ever destroy that indestructible pact in purpose. But see, see, we look at this. Israel's justice system was not operated by God, but was by men. You know, God gives laws, but people must execute them for their own benefit. You know, God requires this from every nation and regards every nation to be either in compliance with or contrary to his justice system. Uh, that we are all, in other words, that we are all equal sons and daughters, or we're all equal sons of Adam. And that the earth was made for all mankind, you know, confirm that no person possesses a God-approved authority to to take from others what is not given to them by consent or force. Since kings, since the kings do not owe the fields, but are merely served by God's creation, just as the lowly or poor people or the elderly, you know, express the law should never be used to oppress the poor and the needy of society. The poor are most likely unable to protect themselves in the event of an attack against rich and powerful evil men and women. Sound principles confirm that if God, you know, gave the entire earth to all of the children of men to use and to enjoy, and to enjoy for their benefit, then certainly no government is comprised of men. I right, can deprive what only God can grant to them. Consequently, what belongs to Caesar are only those things that have been given to him by the people's consent or decision and for their and for their benefit no human can unjustly force from the people what god has granted by natural right and people cannot consent to authority for their harm for their harm for harm to be done to them all right upon this maximum you know each and every person have the natural right to use his or her own body, mind, and soul in conjunction with the property of the earth that he or she uses and is entitled to, to preserve, uh, provide, and to sustain him or herself and his or her family. Okay, Another man's or government's uh, attempt to subvert this God-given uh, right contradicts what God's command to all mankind is to be fruitful and to multiply all over the earth and to replenish the earth and to subdue it. You know, this universal command cannot be construed to create slaves for the government. To control for their benefit. All right. The contrary, it strongly necessitates 
you know, that all mankind utilize or utilizes the natural grants of what God, of what of God for the very benefit of the individual, families, and societies. Government, notwithstanding a natural, uh, notwithstanding naturally. Okay, now here's an example. This is Noah. He began, he, uh, Noah began to be a husbandman and he planted a vineyard, all right, from the same godly command. All mankind is to become a husbandman and workman of his own body and property for his and his neighbor's benefit, not governments. All right, government is to protect those rights of men. Having to let's see, having to mend their lives and instruments of husbandry. Let me read that again. So no, he was he had a vineyard. He became a workman of his own body and property for his and his neighbor's benefit, not government's benefit, okay? Government is to protect, I want to read it again, those rights of man, leaving to men their lives and instruments of husbandry, okay? God's creation reveals to us that all men are created in a state of, of nature, you know, with perfect freedom and equality. No one person has more earthly power and jurisdiction than another person. All men have a reciprocal obligation, means individual obligation, to execute justice and charity to their fellow men who need it. Likewise, all societies have the same duty towards other societies. Governments has no more power than what is the duty of mankind in general. Since government is simply a unified is is wait a minute I, I read that wrong. Yeah, unified power to protect what the laws of nature teach are man's rights. No one ought to harm another person, you know, in his or her life, you know, health, uh, liberty, or possessions either. You know, it follows that higher powers have no rightful authority to violate what the individual cannot violate. It says, when men attempt to usurp the properties and lives of which God gives to each and all, what they're doing is they violate the very essence of God's creation and commandments. Men cannot, with God's ordination, conspire to have um, dominion over God's creation. Says, you know, which is mankind. You know, all men are gods for his workmanship, not governments. You know, God's ministers must conform to that truth and cannot violate the laws of God in a collective matter, meaning the government, for example. Says what God prohibits on an individual matter, consequently, the workmen uh, should not be afraid of God's ministers when he or she is doing what is right. Even consent of the majority, you know, of people does absolutely not bind God's ordination 
where the consent is outside of God's scope of authority. I mean, of ordination, I'm sorry. Um, the very purpose of law is to restrain evil men and women, not to give evil men and women, you know, God's ordination. All right, let's consider this. It says, in the area of paying tribute to the temple, you know, for... Um, you know, it's the tax, you know, that's given. So we're going to read more about that. Let me get over here. You know, Timothy, wait a minute, messed up, paying uh, tribute to the temple, uh, particular expresses, Jesus tells the apostle, tells apostle Peter that those who are not forced to pay tribute are free. Jesus being the Son of God, and thus not, and who was not obligated to pay tribute to the temple of God. Jesus implied, among other principles, that paying tribute should hold legitimate purpose. You know, so that the story goes like this. I'm going to read it to you. And when they were, when they came to Capernaum at the temple, they that received tribute money came to P Apostle Peter and said, Why does not your master pay tribute? And Peter said, Yes. And when he was, and when he came into the house, Jesus then prevented him from from saying what what thinks you Simon of whom do the kings of this earth take custom to or tribute of their very own children or of strangers and Peter said to Jesus to him meaning Jesus of strangers and Jesus then replied unto, unto Simon, Then are the children free? So the answer would be no. They would not be free. So see, that's why when you go to the temple or church and ask for offering, you give as you're led. You give as you are guided by the Spirit. And if you know that they're teaching right, and if you're able to give, you give. If you don't have money to give, and it's not because you're poor. It's not because you're doing something wrong. But it may be because you're poor. I've gone to church a lot of times. And I didn't have the money. Most of the time, I didn't have it. You know, a lot of people gave me horrible looks. They wanted me to give. So sometimes I still had to give, even though I didn't really have the money to give. And it really put me in an awkward position because they were looking at me and judging me, which they shouldn't have been doing in the first place. But as we'll see, where it says where people get offended because you don't give, you know. Because you don't have the money, you need to give anyway. That way they won't be offended by it. But really, it's not about that. It's what you can give. Because you should give if you're able to. But if you don't have the money, then somebody shouldn't force you to give. You know. So let's read this. It says, Inherited in Jesus' response to Peter's statement that was given, that he gave, is the notion of paying tribute for arbitrary versus legitimate purposes Jesus went so far as to you know rebuke Peter for his knee-jerk response to the church's tribute you know collectors who were collecting an offering or a tax even though such a payment of tribute was voluntary it's voluntary to give it's never a requirement you know, God didn't say, you must give 10% or you're going to hell. No, God never said that. That's a requirement. That's, that's, that's a voluntary response. All churches need money. Even I need money. If you don't give, that's fine because God will make a way. But if you're able to donate, that's what I say. It's voluntarily. But I hope that you will consider to donate. But the thing is, it's the same with all churches. It's a voluntary thing. It's not something where you have to do it. But they make it, it's voluntary and it's not, it's not uh, compulsory, which means you have to do it. It says, even where tribute was voluntary and monumental, or nominal, 
nominal, uh, Jesus took uh, the opportunity to teach Peter a principal lesson here. That being forced to pay for something that is uh, unrighteous or unjust equates to being not free. All right, so on the same occasion, Jesus gives only one qualifying reason, you know, for paying even a nominal, nominal or voluntary uh, tribute to a religious institution like a temple. I mean, nothing being nothing was at, nothing being said that was concerning paying, you know, undue. Uh, burden some taxes and submission to an unjust civil government but listen this is what he says he says no nope, says notwithstanding lest we should offend them go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first um, comes up or bites on it and when you have opened up his mouth you will find a piece of a coin in there which was a denaria or a piece of money in there which was a denaria it had the picture of Caesar on there it says it says that it says take that and give and give that coin unto them for me and you that's basically what it says there that's what d and thou and d is me and you it says uh the justification for paying the nominal voluntary tribute or voluntary tribute to the temple was not some mindless unconditional duty to submit to a higher power even though Jesus expressed the right of not having to uh, to pay the tribute uh, when he said, lest we should offend them. Jesus then acknowledges throughout the Gospels a priority in spiritual matters over the physical. Okay, still, Jesus recognizes that paying tribute to the temple may be limited based upon other duties being much superior than simply not offending others. It says, where higher powers demand unreasonable or unjust, you know, I lost my place. I lost my place. Hold up a minute. Okay, we'll just start here. When the high powers demand unreasonable or unjust, Jesus would have invoked the superior duty of executing justice against unjust actions we know this because that is what he demanded from the pharisees in this case jesus paying the small amount of 15 pence equated to turning the other cheek for the simple sake of not offending those who did not realize that Jesus was the Son of God and thus not obligated to pay such an earthly tribute uh, were the same men to demand that Jesus relinquish the entire treasure bag of money or more All right. which was held by Judas Iscariot for Christ's ministry Jesus would have invoked 
he would have invoked a superior duty to resist and would not have paid out of his own monies, of his own money. Jesus did not pay out of his or Peter's own money, even under, even under Benigan, you know, under, you know, you know, hard circumstances. Um, thus, superior duty, the superior duty is seen very clearly when Jesus assaulted the money changers and physically drove them out of the temple. You know, Jesus, you know, used offensive force to ensure that men did not use the temple of God, you know, for illegitimate illegitimate purposes. You know, in the same spirit of righteousness, he meaning Jesus certainly does not demand that we submit to evil commands, you know, under the same pretext of ordained higher powers. Okay, righteousness is the standard upon which our responses and also reactions to such demands rest upon. Not blind, not blind, unconditional submission. Okay. Besides, the duty of not offending others regarding paying tribute The church operates more serious duties and obligations exist as Jesus expresses throughout his ministry. It says a duty to do or not to do something has many limitations when the duty only derives from merely not offending other person not offending another person now what about harming one's family you know neighborhood and or community uh, what about destroying justice in the whole country uh, certainly one's duty in those regards transcends a duty of not offending a God-rejecting ruler in government. An unjust government can't hold a higher level of loyalty than our bro brother covenants. You know, covenants which, if broken, God will punish the offender. As Jesus says, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, and brethren, you know, it is, if it is, if it is honorable and right to die for a friend, it is more honorable to live your life uh, beneficially for your friend and to resist those who would cause damage to you or your friend and brethren's life and family. After all, the essence of laying down one's life for his friend is that he save the life of his friend. Such a sacrifice is is quintessential purpose of self defense. You know, it's really the real main, the real reason why we have self defense is really what that big word is quintessential, meaning it's really paramount. That's why we have self defense in the first place. You know, saving life, living such a life includes granting or permitting to government no more power or authority than what yourself possess. 
you know, as an individual has, you know, in, in relation to others, okay? Now, to show the true extent of submission in the name of not offending, you know, when Jesus paid tribute, you know, in the temple, he did not do so with his own money, no, despite having it, but from abandoned, uh, lost, and found monies. Right? Jesus did not did not deprive money from those who Jesus knew needed it more. And Jesus did not sacrifice his ministry to pay tribute, even though he could have, you know, created the money by his own spoken word or thought, you know. Moreover, the only recorded uh, occasion in Scripture when Jesus, you know, uh, of Jesus paying tribute was not even to a civil government, but to church government, which command is found is all is found in the new Te is found in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, it says the command of paying tribute uh, undoubtedly required every person to pay his or her fair share, which is in quotations, for church government and public worship. Yet, despite this command, Jesus paid no tribute of his own with his own money, even though the tribute requested came from the Old Testament law, which was to pay this money for the atonement of your souls. All right. Much less did Jesus pay taxes from his very own money to the Roman Empire. So, how can Jesus condemn Christians of any dispensation for not paying from their own money? What Jesus himself was not even willing to pay, you know, living under such a church or civil government, both being higher powers. When Jesus paid the money found in the fish's mouth, he paid Peter's too. He paid Peter's, you know, tribute as well. Okay? Now, thus not requiring for Peter to pay from his money. Jesus then acknowledges a limitation of one's paying tribute or taxes, i.e. submitting to government. Okay. Higher powers are then established so that the heritage of the Lord our God may live peaceably and quietly in all honesty and in godliness. You know, benefactor of government is God's acceptable will so that men may come to the very knowledge of salvation and truth. Living peaceable with other men is not possible when, the gov when their government contradicts its God-ordained uh, purposes or purpose and usurps the authority arranged by God becoming you know anti-Romans chapter 13 government which is what we see a lot today in the world you know we want to be like the government in what God talked about we want the governments to be like that you know so uh, you know, we have this happening when they're going against what God arranged you know, arranged by God, this authority that was arranged by God and was set up by God and becoming an anti Romans chapter thirteen government, which is what we have in our country today. You know, are those who usurp God ordain uh, limitations worthy of honor and submission from others, 
okay, are those uh, people who defend themselves, their families, and neighbors. While, while, while they're doing that, they're violating God's will of peace, um, you know, where they attempt to prevent injury and damage, you know, is not providing for a family and defending against undressed uh, intrusion, seeking, you know, seeking the ways of peace either, okay? Or, let's see, or did God mean that seeking peace is doing whatever, you know, the more powerful person demands or wants to do, or wants for you to do? I don't think so. What, I mean, that, I mean, what that is is nonsense, because that's not what it meant at all. No. The ways of peace necessi uh, necessarily involve, you know, involve resistance to those who would harm the peace of you, your family, your neighbors. You know, the opposite conclusion is to argue that honesty men, let's see, to argue that honesty men may not oppose robberies or pirates because this may occasion, this may cause, you know, disorder or bloodshed, because it would, right? So as soon as any limitation of submission is admitted, one has a duty and obligation to know how to judge all of the limitations of higher powers and the correlative limits of his own submission. God's prescription here that was given Description here upon um, ordained uh, ministers are not merely suggestions. However, if they are merely suggestions, then so is the correlative submission. On the other hand, if the command to submit is, bl is blatant and defiant, then so are the conditions and qualifications of the higher powers. Uh, one cannot argue with credibility that God's commands to submit to government are absolute and unconditional. Yet the qualifications of God ordain government or merely suggestions or hypothetical. No, this is the essence of using sound interpretation of words. Okay. Says those who argue that God mandates Christian for Christians to submit to any and all powers that be without or without giving any reference to God's stipulations, turn a ministry, I'm going to find out here, of God, of God into a government that one, one, does right in his own eyes, two, or secondly, punishes those who do good and praises those who do evil and three becomes a minister of Satan for their own sake this kind of government would certainly bear the sword in vain okay now there's an ekin it's Greek ekin meaning without cause. 
It says, in con it's also uh, in contradiction to what Paul's description of God-ordained ruler. How can Paul suggest that the sword be used only for cause when God supposedly ordained it to be used arbitrarily, um, randomly, and contrary to justice. Are good works cause for punishment with God's ordination? No, good works cannot be determined, cannot be deemed any action which does not resist or rebel against government. Just the opposite. Good works are actions which uphold God's standard for righteousness and justice. They're very tools of it, you know. They include resisting government. If peace is good, then so are justifiable means of ordaining peace itself. You know, see, Scripture reveals to us the same by stating, Depart from evil and do, and, and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And go after it. Run after it. And this basically what it says, Let therefore follow after the things which make for peace. And stand for peace. Uh, naturally, peace does, does not exist unless good people propose or not. That good people oppose, meaning are against evil. All right. Where government is oppressive and unjust, the good of peace can only be obtained by the good actions of dismounting such government okay for the cause of setting meaning innocent prisoners free higher powers are ordained just the same way ordained to give light you know warmth wait a minute I messed up higher powers are ordained just as the sun was ordained to give light to the planet, warmth, and also to bring nutri nutrients to the soil. You know, God did not create the sun to destroy, but to benefit, you know, all mankind in creation. You know, John Calvin, Calvin once observed, governments function as the same saying is governments all right function among men is no less than that of bread water sun and air to this very end our submission and follow and our fellow and our fellowship or fellowship is to righteousness and to godliness not towards those who yield or wield sword in, con in, in contradiction of what God's ordination is what God's ordination you know so we don't we don't we don't yield against the will of God here we stay within it, it says um, oppressive rulers vexingly or willingly you know set themselves up as God I mean they try to act like they're God Meaning they try to become like their God when they really are not. They become representing of the God of this world, Satan, not of the God of the universe. Especially those who claim to have God's uh, sanction upon their use of power and unjust actions. Their form acts simultaneously become uh, anti antithetical antithetical to the government that is described in Romans chapter 13 so God's ordination is only attached to 
an authority that uh, that comports to God's laws as created upon his own by his spoken word of let there be light and at the same point of God's creating light for the earth God's laws demanded let there also be justice and that they are inseparable they, are, they walk together hand in hand so is submission regarding the same so you know we have to have light and justice because they go together so that's where we're going to stop today hope you enjoyed it we're going to read chapter 7 next week next wednesday in romans 13 and i hope you can join us here physically at 7110 new hunter road apartment 423 mechanicsville virginia i'm michael de Soas, evangelist of new hunter church of christ off of new hunter road we'd love to have you we'll see you next week please come and i love you stay strong in the lord and don't give up god don't hasn't given up on you and he won't and the only way you can give up is if you give up on him but god will never forsake you or leave you that's what the scriptures do say so in keeping with that remember that dear lord thank you for everything thanks for the time that we got together we're able to read this hope people understand it get something out of it and can take it and share it with other people so they understand that we don't need to have people rule over us that are going against and being contrary to your word and what your laws were set up in light of what the scriptures do dictate but instead they come up with their own artificial laws to try to overthrow your laws and liberty and freedom because that's really where it all comes from is from your from your word that's where freedom came from that's where the constitution came from and that's how our land became so free and now they want to try to go against that and become gods themselves but not gods of doing good by following your ordained instructions but gods of following their own instructions which will lead to total chaos and destruction of a society and lord we don't want to become that we want to follow after your instructions so we can have order and peace and hopefully, Lord, that will be your will. And thank you for everything that you do. And Jesus, in your wonderful name, I pray. Amen. See you next week. And please come on Sunday at 11 a.m. We'll have morning service here at New Honor Church of Christ. We're doing a series called Truth and Reason. Hope to see you then at 11 a.m. tomorrow. I mean, not tomorrow, but on Sunday morning. And again at 7 p.m. for Sunday night. See you next week. I love you. Stay strong.